Hello, everyone. Sorry to be a little late. I had some technical trouble with my computer, but that has been resolved. Let's share a screen. How's everybody this Friday? No comments. Sleepy? Sleepy. Sleepy. Well, welcome to the club. Everybody has their coffees or whatever it is that you use. All right. Okay. Let's get back to our uh, mass transport and let's see whether that has uh, good waking up properties or good sleeping properties. I think I know the answer already, but uh, let's give it a shot anyway. So we have discussed last time um, a specific problem in a mass transport and just to briefly review of what is the notation that we have when we look at, we are either going to look at mass concentration or fraction. When we are solving problems, we are typically solving for mass fraction. It's already a normalized number. It's actually a good idea to solve for normalized numbers or molar fraction, which comes from molar concentration. Okay, so number of moles per volume or uh, mass or in kilograms or grams per volume. And one thing that we're looking at, we're looking at diffusing species through another species. So uh, at the very minimum, so at the very minimum, we have a binary mixture. So chemical A is diffusing through B. B is often actually the rest, everything. So I know that in water, I have dissolved uh, different chemical species. So I might actually looking through like salt or sugar in my tea, if you will. Well, so in my tea, I had water, I have tea, I have all kinds of uh, spices that I put in there. Um, I might look through as sugar diffusing through it. And then everything else that I might have in that water is labeled as B. So that's just a practical way. This is not to say that you don't have multiple, you have probably 20 plus species in the water, I have some calcium carbonate for that matter because I live in Texas and water is pretty hard even after I filter it. So in that sense, you have all these other things, but question is, are you tracking them? And are they of the interest in, this, uh, in the problem that you're solving? Um, tracking 20 things at a time means that also you need to measure 20 things at a time and that we simply don't do. So this is the reason why you typically call whatever it is that you're diffusing or you're interested in tracking A and everything else is B. Now, that species within the phase that you have uh, is, uh, has its own velocity and possibly because it might be diffusing counter to wherever the phase is going, you, you actually can have a velocity that is slightly different from that of the entire phase. So we refer to that velocity as VA. And if I'm, uh, and it comes from basically, um, it's a, uh, you, overall velocity is a fraction of A times VA plus fraction of BVB. Now numbers of moles and mass can sl slightly, those fractions can slightly differ. So when, I, when you're looking at the velocity uh, average that uh, for molar concentration, we refer to it uh, with the star. And then I'm using molar fractions, XAVA plus XBBB. And if I multiply this by rho or this by C, I'm going to get similar expressions for momentum. Okay? So momentum of the entire phase is the momentum of uh, all of the individual species summed up. All right. Now, we also might have production or consumption of the species within a volume. And if we're looking at the mass rate of production or consumption per volume, I'm using lowercase r and uppercase r for a molar. And then our fixed law relates the simplest situation when I have the flux of A because just because of the difference in concentration, there's nothing else that I'm looking into here. 
And then I'm, since I'm using the concentration, uh, the fraction here, mass fraction, omega A, everything is multiplied with rho. And then I have this diffusivity DAB, that's diffusivity of A and B. We know that the diffusivity in uh, A and B, B is the same as DBA, so frankly, we could just use D here, but for clarity, we are uh, keeping AB. And then my combined flux, this should be A, and A uh, of, of species A is this fixed law flux, just due to uh, differences in, in mass uh, concentration or fraction, plus whatever else might move into my control volume, which is convection. So there is a convective part here, rho A, B. And I have equivalent expressions for molar, Okay, so I'm just going to use uppercase J for a molar equivalent, and here there will be V star. Okay, so the way I go back and forth my molar and mass fractions is that I recognize that my mass concentration is molar concentration times molar mass of component A, which I get by looking up uh, in my periodic system. Okay. Excellent. So if I look at my conservation law for any species A, I have that the change of uh, mass fraction in time is divergence, which collects everything that goes through the boundary of my combined flux of A. And I'm using alpha here because it could be any species now, A, B, and basically I have this conservation law for all of them plus R alpha. So this is for alpha is equal to A, B. If I have more than two, then I'm gonna label them slightly differently. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so forth. And I have equivalent expressions uh, for change in time. So we are immediately actually um, uh, now doing equations of change in time. For steady state and um, no time change, this will simply be a zero. And then I have an equivalent expression for molar. Okay, so that's the notation overview. We solved the problem last time, which is uh, BSL chapter 18.2, which is a diffusion through a stagnant film, which is, it is one of the classical problems that appears a lot. So if I think that I have a beaker and there is a liquid A at the bottom of that beaker, then right near the interface, I actually have vapor of A sitting on top. And essentially there's from this interface, I'm gonna have uh, the largest concentration of A in this beaker. And it's, there's some gas B sitting on top. So this could be air, okay? water and air, for instance. Now I'm assuming for this problem that both uh, vapor of A and B are ideal gases in room temperature, that's a perfectly fine as assumption. And I have a stream here that is keeping concentrations of A and B constant. So there's a stream of maybe it's just air, maybe it's a uh, vapor of A and uh, uh, va vapor of water here, assuming A is water and this air mixture, but that gas stream is maintaining constant concentrations of both A and B that I know. Okay. So those I'm referring, so I'm saying that this Z, this is my Z, it's pointing upwards. I have constant concentration of A and B um, at Z right here and constant concentration of A and B at Z is equal to Z2. And I know, if I know XA1 and XA2, I immediately know B because the sum of all of these molar fractions has to be one. Okay, so in this particular case, since I only have A and B, B, X, A, B2 is one minus X, A2. Okay, excellent. So we do our standard shell balance. I need a flux of something. What am I going to look at as the flux? It's now molar flux because my boundary conditions are given as molar fractions. So I got to use my molar versions of the formulas. And that's much more common to do for uh, gases. So I need to label also my cross-sectional area as S because I'm using A for the species. So now my S, so whatever, if I look at the small segment of this, this is a one-dimensional problem. Nothing is going in any other direction. So this is a typical one-dimensional pro uh, pro uh, problem. 
So basically, I'm going to have um, S here as a cross-sectional area. So the way I figure out how much of uh, species A is going through this is I take flux of A at Z and multiply it by area. That's what's entering the volume and what's exiting the volume is flux of A evaluated at Z plus delta Z and also times the same area. This is a Cartesian coordinate system, so areas are the same. I don't have any production or consumption of A inside of this. If I did, I would basically put this RA, the rate, and multiply it by volume, okay? But I don't have it. If I did, there would be RA times S times delta Z here is equal to zero. So this is a standard procedure. It almost doesn't matter which flux you're looking at as long as you know what's going on in your medium. But now we are looking at the molar fluxes. Yeah. Excellent. So we divide that by the volume S delta Z. And when I divide, I get sort of like already a familiar expression. It's minus Na at Z plus delta Z minus Na at Z divided by delta Z. So this is a shorthand notation for that. And that has to be equal to zero. When I take a limit, when delta Z goes to zero, still the same story. So my derivative of NAZ, CZ is equal to zero. This should be a deja vu by now. We had a similar expression for energy uh, or the combined energy flux before, as well as my momentum, the combined momentum flux. It's just that there we looked at the phi ZZ because there was an entire matrix. Um, okay, whoops. All right, so this is what we're solving. Now, the biggest question in all of these problems is, what is this NAZ? So if I remind myself, I'm not going to go through the, uh, uh, through the uh, entire derivation, but this is a general uh, formula for if I have a binary mixture, then my NA is, this is the fixed law part plus the convective part for both. And the biggest part in these is when I express my NA, uh, I need to solve for something, and these boundary conditions are in terms of XA. So I got to convert this equation into an equation for XA. And for that, I got to figure out what is my NA. Okay, so if I do that and I write down what NA is, I will have NB appear here, flux of B, as part of this general convective flux of whatever moves into my volume. Well, uh, I got a problem with that. I got to express that somehow in terms of NA or else I'm going to have uh, uh, issues here. Well, in this particular problem, it's relatively simple. The keyword here is stagnant and that allows me to put this NB to approximately zero. So I have relatively slow problem overall and B is even slower it's Na that is diffusing, so I'm just approximating with, uh, with zero. Excellent. So when I do that, then I can actually move it out, and then I can clearly express Na in terms of uh, gradient of Xa. And when I look at its Z component, I get this expression. Okay? Sure. So this is basically, does anybody have a question? Stop me if you. Okay, so this is my expression for NAZ. This is the very important part because we always, to actually get from what I, uh, when I balance my fluxes, I typically get the differential equation in terms of flux, but I'm measuring things typically in terms of concentrations and this relates the two. So it's a very uh, important part. Also, I might be measuring concentration or I might be measuring flux. And I got to be able to go back and forth between the two. Or I might be interested in evaluating what the overall flux is. Either way, um, these are like it's the biggest thing in the solving these problems is going back and forth the fluxes and whatever is the uh, driver or the driver for your entire problem. In this case, it's concentrations. So when I put that in, well, okay. Derivative of this is zero. That means that this expression is a constant and we solved for that. We plugged in boundary conditions and we got last time uh, this expression for uh, concentrations of A 
It looks complicated, but it's not really, these are relatively simple numbers to compute. I can also, this is a normalized Z. So this way your XA, XB, they go between zero and one because they're fractions. And so does Z. So it's actually, you could call this Z bar, normalized Z. So then when you also recognize that XB1 is one minus XA1, then this is a relatively simple uh, law for uh, X's. Okay. So now let's actually look at a practical problem of putting some uh, numbers on it. Um, oh, and of course I didn't add myself some slides. Let me add myself some slides and then we will start writing. And I will flip over. So let's put some numbers on there. using this. So these situations where you have essentially evaporating liquid A moving through something else is one of the most common problems. Um, as long as you can assume that concentrations are relatively low, which is where this applies, um, we can actually look at, okay, how much water evaporates from um, any lake in Austin, uh, Texas, when it's 36 degrees Celsius outside. Evaporation. from a lake in Austin at 36 degrees Celsius. Now, I don't have necessarily a beaker, but at the lake, I can also assume that nothing's really changing in Z, and the main driver is ev evaporation from the surface of the lake upwards, okay? And there's some wind somewhere on top that is uh, possibly making this uh, this uh, situation very similar to the beaker that we had. So again, with some approximation, we can assume that the water is evaporating from Lake of Austin. That water could be evaporating from any other surface. You could also assume that this is evaporating um, when you're sweating, there's an evaporation from the surface of your body into the uh, surrounding area. So it's kind of like a very applicable problem. So let's look at the fluxes. So first things first, say the temperature is 36 degrees. And what helps me there is what I really need. I already have a model that gives me uh, what this uh, uh, what this XA uh, should be. The problem is actually evaluating boundary conditions here. What is XA1? What is XA2, right? So what we are do, I'm going to assume here, we're going to assume that where's my, oh, my temperature is 36 degrees. And what helps uh, evaluating in th this, that helps actually evaluate what is XA1. XA1, it comes from an equilibration of vapor at the surface of a liquid. So vapor of a liquid at the surface of a liquid. And there is actually a um, formula for that. It's C pressure of vapor at equilibrium divided by pressure. And that for pressure of vapor, we actually have a formula. So I'm going to give you an approximate formula, vapor pressure approximate for formula. And that formula says one of them. Um, it's not the only one. It's a, it's a correlation or it's a FET. So uh, there might be multiple out there. It's exponential function of 28, uh, 386. Apologies. 
I gotta look up these numbers correctly from my notes. Minus five one three two over T millimeter. So this is And this is, that's what I pulled off from the table. This is 133.32 Pascals. If I assume that my pressure is one atmosphere. And my P vapor using these, uh, these this temperature is, uh, my notes say I'm not gonna, I'm gonna just give you what that evaluates to. So the key here is that I have vapor of liquid A and liquid in equilibrium. For that, so I need to evaluate the concentration, molar concentration of A or fraction rather. It's the same as the pressure of the vapor divided by the pressure. So when I, and I have a formula for vapor pressure. That's probably reviewing your thermodynamics class. So that gives me in these conditions, XA1 of, again, my notes claim that it's 0 0.058. Okay, so things are diffusing. I also pull the formula for or approximation for the diffusivity. And that is 2.5 times 10 to the minus five meters square per second. This is water vapor. Uh, uh, in air. And frankly, one thing that you need to look for when you have gases 10 to the minus five uh, meters squared per second, that's the correct um, order of magnitude. Okay. And we will assume that we have sort of somewhere further away at uh, from that surface. So I have, oh no, uh, wrong color. Let's do this in blue. So I have approximately flat surface of lake. And this is my Z is equal to Z1, which is, I'm gonna label it as zero. And somewhere at 20 centimeters away, 0.2 meters, I have air. And that air is whisking away. So that there's a little bit of wind. And for that wind on top, that's whisking away all of the water vapor. That's what we're gonna assume. So my XA2 is going to be equal to zero at Z2 is equal to 0 0.2 meters. So wind is whisking away. Is whisking away a good expression? English is my single, second language all please correct me all of um water vapor so those are my boundary conditions and basically the moment i have them so this is at z1 is equal to zero The moment I have them, I can actually plug in for 
things to the problem. And I can definitely, so I have based on the formula here, I have what is my concentration and how is it changing from 0, 0.0 uh, or rather molar fraction from 0 0.058 to the top. The problem is that's a fraction that got, doesn't give me an actual number. For an actual number, I also need to uh, figure out what is C, C A and C B, right? So I know that my X A is C A of C. Well, what is C? So C, we're going to assume is basically more uh, number of moles uh, for air. And we're going to assume that air, assume air is ideal gas at PT pressure and temperature given above. And we're going to technically, this C is both air and this vape, water vapor within, but we're just going to take it as all of the air. So it, it is a small approximation. This addition of A is small enough that we can kind of just keep it all. So uh, air is ideal uh, gas at pressure and temperature given above. So what, whoa, my fingers are doing weird things this morning. So my PV is an RT is what applies and what I'm looking for is N over V that's my C so that gives me C as P over RT And I'm taking pressure at one atmosphere. So when I put this in, and I do need to take temperature in Kelvin, so it's one, one, three, two, five pascals divided by R is gas constant. And then my temperature, 36 degrees, I need to add 273.15 to it. That gives me 309.15 Kelvin. So that is 39.41 mole per meter cube. So my XA1 and XA2 definitely give me the distribution of a molar fraction between Z is, Z1 is equal to zero and Z2 is equal to 0.2 meters. What if I'm interested in the flux? So this is where actually ha having a C or number of moles of air helps because I need expression for NAZ for that. That is my flux. Okay. And that has both DAB and C within, as well as DXA, DZ. Okay. So basically, if I'm interested in the flux, that's NAZ, and it's one minus one over one minus six A, C, D, A, B, D, X, A, D, Z. 
And remember for XA, we got that one minus XA, one minus XA one is equal to one minus XA two, which is a number that we have up there, one minus XA one, Z minus Z one divided by Z two minus Z one. So this is my Z minus zero divided by 0.2 minus zero. So if I take the derivative of this, basically I can figure out uh, what So we need to take the derivative. Of this expression above. And when you do, that's going to, so I'm not going to go through the entire process here. You will get the expression that you need in times minus CXA dz. This is part of this one over minus xa and minus the xa dz. You will get that when you take the derivative of the expression before for. Uh, for the when you take this derivative, you will essentially get that. And when we plug in the numbers, one gets 2.355 times 10 to the minus 4 mole per uh, meter, meter square second. Now, if I was going to relate that to, so this is number of moles, so this is flux of water vapor, molar, or combined molar flux of water vapor through air due to evaporation. If I wanted to get mass flux, what would I do? Uh, combined mass flux. What would I do? How do mass flux and molar flux relate? Oh, my hand okay. is having a mind on its own. Anyone? I multiply molar flux with molar flow A. Mm -hmm. And A is water, right? So when you do that, you get how much water in grams. So there's rate per second and also per area. So now if this was a lake, I have area of the lake. I can look at the total evaporation, assuming it's kind of constant everywhere. 
also if 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 you have a system so this is for lake you can't really carefully measure and control lake as a system but if you had this in a lab and you can really carefully measure this flux then you can actually measure gas diffusivity whatever gas is evaporating from a very saturated surface so one could measure this in the lab um, or or basically figure out what dab is in the lab by measuring this flux okay in a careful setup okay so this has wide applications does this make it make a little bit the problem this a and b it was i felt it was very um very abstract and these are problems that are around us you could again if you multiply if you assume the same system of um your sweat evaporating from that's water very briny but water evaporating from the surface of your skin you if you assume similar uh similar situation here i don't know that everything is whisked, whisked away maybe not at uh 20 centi centimeters away from us but so maybe it's the, the 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 boundary conditions would change ever so slightly but you would get the flux this way and you could also see how much water evaporates how much water you're losing through your skin if you know the area of the skin that that's probably a question for I don't know, google <laughs> um or it's a question for a textbook uh, that is applying this in biomedical setting okay so in biomedical engineering transport phenomena class basically for the 85 percent of it sounds the same it's just that their applications are not the poorest media their applications are um to uh tubes inside our body so blood flow and so forth in lungs okay questions Okay, so now I'm going to discuss reactions and uh, how they affect boundary conditions. So when we have reactions, we typically look at two types of reactions. One is homogeneous, and by homogeneous, I mean that I'm looking at it in a volume and I'm assuming it, or possibly upscaling it, to be something that is happening everywhere in the volume at certain rate. That is basically the part that we are adding to the uh, to the equation. So first one is homogeneous, or volumetric. So it can be, um, it can be be assumed same or happening in the same way within a volume everywhere within a volume and basically i have this volumetric rates r a r b also in molar equivalence uppercase r b are specified And they are basically this one is gram per volume per second, or kilogram rather, if I'm going SI units, or number of moles per meter cube second are specified. And they're added as a source term. in shell balance or equation of change okay. now there could be also what we refer to as heterogeneous reactions
And those are surface reactions, and they're typically, since they're on a surface, surface is typically a boundary. So there are surface reactions. and specified through boundary conditions. And on the boundary or surface, it makes sense to look at the flux. I'm gonna call surface, I'm gonna refer to it as gamma. And that flux on a surface is, I'm going to refer to it as some coefficient Kn and Ca to the n and n is so-called order and this is all happening at the gamma. N is reaction order. So it's really how fast is this happening and how does it affect flux? If I'm a linear, so for one, N could be zero in which case I just have that my flux is constant and coming out of the surface. It's kind of rare if I really have reactions that could be just something is flowing in at a constant rate through a surface, but can be modeled in this way by putting n is equal to zero. If I have first order, then I'm calling this kn1, and often they put k double prime up there. That's just a notation really. So K1 CA means that I linearly depend on the, on the uh, concentration of A, or I could depend as a CA square, which is much stronger or uh, stronger dependence on the concentration. So this K N is typically given in meter per second. And this is mole per meter cube when N is equal to one anyway. So my boundary conditions then are typically given Condition. They can be specified, specify XA or Omega A on um, at certain location. location and that location could be surface. Typically those surfaces, we know that bounding surfaces, we attempt to align with the coordinate system. That was the case in that previous, when we had Z is equal to Z1, that was a coordinate plane. And I could also specify in a at the and that could be expressed through that uh, surface reaction formula that I just gave before. And I'll have a third one, which is basically, uh, it's not necessarily reaction, but there is a diffusion happening at the boundary of two different materials. This was similar to Newton's law of cooling. So basically I don't have solid surface, surface or really surface between two different materials where those two different materials 
have um, uh, uh, so this is basically this is basically two way, uh, but we have a diffusion. Go happening uh, through solid and uh, maybe liquid contact in that case I'm going to say that in A that that surface is I'm going to call it zero some coefficient kc which is a mass transfer coefficient times ca0 minus cab and in that case i'm referring to this as a mass transfer coefficient And this is a solid surface concentration. And this is a bulk fluid. So I basically have at that surface, because I have differences in diffusion um, coefficients between two uh, and different speed at which uh, something can diffuse through those two uh, uh, materials in contact because of that i will have a jump in concentration normally i would assume continuous concentration but this continuous uh, it doesn't have time to equilibrate because of the differences in uh, diffusion constants and that uh, basically effectively relates uh, or tr translates to having a jumping concentration in, near that surface and it's given by this formula bulk fluid concentration so i'm gonna say this is a fluid in general so not just liquid but it could be gas or liquid so i'm gonna express that slightly so this is very similar very similar to uh, Newton's law of cooling. And just allow me to, uh, one more minute to specify the fourth one and the next time we're gonna have uh, another problem solved with heterogeneous, uh, with one of the surface reactions plugged in. So basically, for um, we could specify a rate, rate of chemical reaction on the surface. So that's basically using uh, that heterogeneous term. So my Na zero is say for instance for a first order i could have k1 ca0 that's a first order or if it's really faster k2 ca0 square second order Okay, all right. So we're gonna pick up from here. This is basically a list of possibilities that you could have as boundary conditions. And we're gonna now add, and we're gonna now play with different boundary conditions and uh, solving uh, different boundary conditions and different types of uh, uh, geometries. Okay, all right. See you on Monday. And today we're gonna assign homework. And that's going to be the last homework of the semester. Questions? All right.